In our previous class, we have discussed how to combine different component errors to get an estimate of overall uncertainty in the measurement. Uh, in other words, since several, since uh, a particular measurement can be made of various experiments and each experiment can have individual errors associated with it. So, how do I combine these errors or uncertainties to get an overall estimate of the uncertainty in my measurement. Similarly, a particular instrument can have various components and these individual components may be associated with various uncertainties. So, how do I combine these uncertainties to get an estimate of overall uncertainty in my measurement. So, today let us take an example and see whatever we have discussed in the last class how we can apply this. So, let us take an uh, example the resistance of a certain size of copper ware is given as R equal to R 0 into 1 plus alpha into T minus 20. So, it is a familiar equation where R is the resistance of the copper ware, R 0 is the resistance at 20 degree Celsius and given here as R 0 is 6 ohm plus minus 0.2 percent. So, this is the error point plus plus minus 0.2 percent is the error associated with R 0. Alpha which is temperature coefficient of resistance is given as 0 0.004 per degree Celsius plus minus 1 percent. If the temperature is measured with an accuracy of plus minus 1 degree Celsius, calculate the resistance of the wear at 40 degree Celsius and its uncertainty. So, the resistance of a wear is given as R equal to R 0 into 1 plus alpha T minus 20. So, this equation tells us that if I know the resistance R 0 at T equal to temperature equal to 20 degree Celsius from the knowledge of alpha I can calculate the resistance at 40 degree Celsius. We need to find out what is the uncertainty in this computation for resistance at temperature 40 degree Celsius if R 0 alpha and the temperature are given with a specified uncertainty. So, let us try to solve this problem. So, if you remember our previous days lecture we calculated u overall as so we will make use of this equation to find out what is the uncertainty in the computation of r which is resistance at 40 degree Celsius. So, let us try to solve the problem. What is known is resistance at 20 equal to 20 degree Celsius. Let us say I want 
I have alpha equal to 0 0.004 degree 4 per degree Celsius plus minus 2 percent is the temperature coefficient of the resistance and temperature T is measured with accuracy of plus minus 1 degree Celsius. So, by use of this equation, we can find out what is the value of the nominal resistance, what is the value of the resistance in the nominal case. So, we just have to put values of R0, alpha and T in this equation. So, if we do that R at T equal to 40 degree Celsius will be 6 plus 4 which is the value of alpha to 40 minus 20. If you compute this, it will come as 6.48 ohm. Now, we will make use of the equation that we discussed in our last class to find out the uncertainty. Uncertainty in the computation of resistance, let us denote it by UR will be equal to delta r delta r 0 u r 0 square plus delta r delta alpha u alpha square plus delta r delta t u t square and square root of this sum. We wrote this because we know from here that r is a function of r 0 alpha and so, by following whatever we did in our last class, we can obtain an expression for uncertainty in R as this, where u r 0 is the uncertainty in R 0, u alpha is the uncertainty in alpha and u t is the uncertainty in temperature. These values are given and this partial derivatives we can find out from the functional relationship of r equal to r 0 into 1 plus alpha into t minus 20 degree t minus 20. So, let us do that now. So, we need del r del r 0 which is nothing but del del r 0 into r 0 into 1 plus alpha into t minus 20 which will come out as 1 plus alpha into t minus 20. So, if I put the numerical values 1 plus alpha is 0 0.004 and t is 40 minus 20, it will come as 1.08. Next we need delta r delta alpha 
again if we compute this it will be r 0 t minus 20. So, after putting the numerical values it will come as 20 into 6 120. Finally, del r delta t will be r 0 alpha. So, 6 times 0 0.004 which is 0 0.024. So, we now have values for dr delta r del r 0, delta r del alpha and del r del t. We now need to know u r 0, u alpha and u t. u r 0 we consider 0 0.2 percent r 0 is given as 6 ohm plus minus 0 0.2 percent. So, 0 0.2 percent of 6 ohm. So, 6 into 0 0.002 which is 0 0.012 ohm. U alpha is point is 2 percent of 0 0.004. So, it will be 0 0.004 0 0.02 which will be 8 into 10 to the power minus 5 per degree Celsius. If you remember we said R 0 is given as 0 0.2 percent alpha is given as 0 0.004 per degree Celsius plus minus 2 percent and temperature is measured with plus minus 1 degree Celsius accuracy. So, 40 plus minus 1 degree Celsius. So, you obtain the values of u r 0, u alpha and u t from these given values. u t is straight away known as 1 degree Celsius. So, now we just have to put all these values into the equation we wrote. That means, in this equation. So, we now have values for all these terms. So, if we put these values, it will be del r del 0 is 1.08 and u r 0 is 0 0.012, del r del alpha and u alpha. We computed del r del alpha as 120 and u alpha as 8 into 10 to the power minus 5. plus delta r del t and u t. We computed delta r del t as 0 0.024 and u t as 1. So, zero two four one 1 square.
this will be 0 0.0289 ohm. So, the uncertainty in the computation of resistance at 40 degree Celsius is 0 0.0289 ohm. If you want to express this in terms of percentage, we can do that 0 0.0289 divided by 6.48. You remember 6.48 is the resistance under nominal case into 100 percent. This will come as 0 0.45 percent. So, we now know how to compute the overall uncertainty in the measurement. Let us take another example. The governing equation for the capillary tube viscometer is well known. So, let us consider a capillary tube viscometer. The governing equation is the well known Hagen Poiseuille equation. which is Q pi d to the power 4 1 2 8 eta into L, where Q is volume flow rate, volumetric flow rate of fluid in the capillary. D is diameter of the capillary. Eta is coefficient of dynamic viscosity. L is length of capillary tube. and delta P is pressure drop across two ends of the capillary tube. Now, the question you ask is if Q L D and P are measured with an uncertainty of plus minus one person, how accurately the dynamic viscosity eta is known. So, we are considering a capillary tube viscometer and performing an experiment to determine the viscosity eta, the coefficient of dynamic viscosity eta. To determine eta, we must have the knowledge of volumetric flow rate of the fluid in the capillary, the diameter of the capillary and the length of the capillary tube as well as the pressure drop. The pressure drop is missing here, so this pressure drop. So,
this is the hagen poiseuille equation which can be used to determine the dynamic viscosity eta from the knowledge of volumetric flow rate pressure drop diameter and length of the tube so the question you ask is if the volumetric flow rate the length of the tube diameter of the tube and the pressure drop are measured with an uncertainty of plus minus 1 of 1 person how accurately eta is known we can follow the same approach that we just followed to solve the previous problem to solve this problem as well eta is pi d to the power 4 128 q l delta p just rearrange the eigen poiseuille equation so eta is a function of d q l and delta p so the overall uncertainty can be computed as L Now we can find out these partial derivatives from this relationship and all these values are specified as 1 percent that means 0.01. So, following the same approach, we can determine the overall uncertainty in the measurement of dynamic viscosity eta. If you do this, if you find out all these partial derivatives. the final equation will look like After putting the numerical values, you will get as or 4.36 volts. So, this is the uncertainty in the measurement of 
dynamic viscosity. Now, if we ask again that the uncertainty in the measurement of diameter is reduced to say plus minus 0.1 percent by using very improved instruments. So, what will be its effect on the overall uncertainty? First, we saw that when all the measurements of Q, D, L and delta P are available with plus minus 1 percent accuracy, we have the overall accuracy as 4.36 percent. Now, we say only the diameter is measured with much more improved instrumentation. So, that the uncertainty associated with the measurement of the diameter is reduced to 0.1 percent. So, what will be the effect on the overall uncertainty? If you do the same calculations while u d will now be 0.001 while all other u's will be 0.1. So, which is So, the uncertainty is reduced to 1.78 percent. So, percentage improve if you calculate the percentage improvement will be it was 4.36 which is about 59.17 percent. So, more than 59 percent improvement in the overall measurement of dynamic viscosity just by reducing the uncertainty in the diameter measurement from 1 percent to 0.1 percent. If you look at the relationship eta with the diameter q l and delta p you see eta varies with fourth power of diameter that is the reason we see a very sharp very sharp decrease in uncertainty when we reduce the uncertainty in the diameter. Now, let us close our discussion on error analysis by having some more discussion on the probability distribution function that we talked about in our last class. We said that the measurement sets that contain only random errors conform to the Gaussian distribution. So, measurement sets that contain only random errors usually conform to Gaussian distribution also known as normal distribution. We wrote the probability density function as the normal distribution function. where mu is 
the mean of the measurements and sigma is standard deviation. The maximum probability occur at x equal to mu the mean and what will be the value of this probability? We can obtain this if I put x equal to mu here. So, the value of this probability will be one by sigma square root of pi because this entire value will be equal to 1. So, the smaller value of sigma will produce larger values of this probability and this is expected intuitively also. So, the probability at x equal to mu is sometimes called measure of precision of the data. We now want to determine the likelihood that a certain data points will fall within a specified deviation from the mean of all the data points. So, what you ask is we wish to determine the likelihood that certain data points will fall within a specified deviation from the mean of all the data points. We can find this out using the definition of the distribution function. The probability that a measurement will fall within a certain range x 1 of the mean reading mu will be so this is the probability that a measurement will fall within mu plus x 1 and mu minus x 1. So, the probability that a particular measurement will fall between mu minus x 1 to mu plus x 1 can be obtained from the definition of the distribution function. So, if I substitute If I make this substitution, it can be shown that P is where Now, the values of this Gaussian normal error function which is
and the integral are given or are available in the form of tables. The Gaussian normal error function and the integral of the Gaussian function are available as standard tables. We can make use of that table to find out what is the probability the particular measurement will fall within say plus minus 1 standard deviation or plus minus 2 or plus minus 3 standard deviation. So, how do we do that? So, let us ask ourselves what is the probability that a measured or a measurement will fall within one, two, and three standard deviation of the mean value. So, we need to determine what is the probability that a particular measurement will fall within mu plus minus sigma, sigma is standard deviation. So, we can make use of what we learned here, we need This is same as so we want to find out what is the probability that a particular measurement will fall within one standard deviation of the mean value. Let us denote that by this. So, all we need to do is for eta 1 equal to 1, we need to look under the table what is the value of this integral. If you look at the table, this value is 0.34134. Which will come as 0.6827. Similarly, the probability that a particular measurement will fall within plus minus 2 sigma of the mean value can be computed as 2 into the value of this when eta 1 equal to 2 which can be found from the table whose value can be obtained as 0.47725. This will be 0.9545. Finally, P3 can be similarly obtained as value of this when eta 1 equal to 3. From the table, you can obtain the value as 0 0.49865, which will be 0 0.9973. So, what we conclude is that the probability that a measurement will fall within 
plus minus sigma of the mean value is 68.27 percent. Similarly, if the measurements the probability that a measurement will fall within 2 sigma of the mean value is 95.45 percent and the probability that a particular measurement will fall within 3 standard deviations of the mean value is 99.73 percent. All these computations are of course, based on the fact that the measurement sets conform to normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. So, this closes, this ends our discussion on error analysis. We will now move on to transducers. Transducers are devices that transform signals in one form to a more convenient form. So, it is a device which will receive a signal in one form and it will convert to another form which is more suitable for the purpose of measurement. Please note that it is not just conversion of energy associated with that signal. So, it is not just conversion of energy in one form to another. Let us now talk about transducers. Transducers are devices that transform signals in one form to a more convenient form. So, it is a device that receives signal in one form and converts that signal to another form which is more suitable for the purpose of measurement. It is not just conversion of energy. Let us take example of diaphragm you imagine a thin metallic diaphragm or thin non metallic diaphragm which will produce a displacement on application of pressure. So, the diaphragm receives pressure as input and gives displacement as output. So, works as a transducer. Note that both displacement and pressure are manifestation of energy, but displacement is more convenient from measurement point of view. Transducers can be of various types, mechanical types, electrical types, optical types, acoustic type etcetera. 
obviously electrical transducers are always preferred because there are several advantages associated with electrical transducers. For example, the signal can be conditioned easily meaning the signal can be modified or amplified or modulated very easily. It is also easy to transfer signal from one place to another. So, electrical transistors will have easy remote operation. For the purpose of this course, we are concerned with electrical transducers or electromechanical transducers that produces an electrical output due to an input of mechanical displacement or strain. So, in this course, we will mainly talk about few electrical transducers or electromechanical transducers that produces an electrical output when it receives mechanical displacement or strain as input. Additionally, we will also talk about just one pneumatic transducer briefly. The mechanical strain or displacement may be produced by primary sensor due to various input physical variables such as temperature, pressure, flow, etcetera. So, during act of measurement, primary sensors that receives input signal from physical variables such as temperature, pressure, flow rates, etcetera may produce a mechanical strain or displacement. We are interested in converting this mechanical strain or displacement into an electrical signal. Like say this is a diaphragm. This is a diaphragm. We will talk about diaphragm in more detail later. When this receives pressure as input, it deflects. So, there is a displacement. If we measure the displacement from the center of this diaphragm, we have this distance as maximum deflection of the diaphragm. We are interested in converting this displacement signal to an electrical output. Similarly, of a force acts here, it will deflect. So, this displacement has to be measured. We are interested in some electromechanical transducers which receives these displacement as input and gives us an electrical output. So, this mechanical displacement or strain can be an output from various primary sensors that receives temperature, pressure, flow rate etcetera as input. So, this mechanical displacement or strain is received by some transducers as input and gives us an electrical output. So, we will learn few such transducers which takes mechanical displacement or strain as input and gives us electrical output. So, we will briefly discuss mostly electromechanical transducers, but we will talk about one pneumatic 
transducer also. Under pneumatic transducer, we will briefly talk about a flapper nozzle system. It is an important pneumatic displacement measuring transducer. It is an integral part of all pneumatic control systems. Under electromechanical transducers, we will briefly discuss four different types of transducers, namely linear variable differential transducer also known as LVDT, then resistance strain gauge, capacitive type transducer and piezoelectric transducer. The linear variable differential transducer or LVDT is an inductance type transducer. Its working principle is based on the fact that magnetic characteristics of an electrical circuit changes due to motion of an object. The working principle of resistance strain gauge is based on the fact that if a conductor is stretched or strained, its resistance will change and it is easy to measure this change in resistance. So, you can measure the strain. Similarly, capacitive type transducer is based on the fact that there is a change in capacitance between two plates due to motion. Finally, piezoelectric transducer is based on the fact that an electrical charge is produced when a crystalline material such as quartz or barium titanate is distorted. So, let us start with flapper nozzle system. Flapper nozzle system is a pneumatic transducer. We know that pneumatic control system operates with air. The signal is transmitted in the form of a variable air pressure in the range of 3 to 5 psi. You have read more about this during discussion on control part of this course. Early days, we had only pneumatic control systems, but with the advent of modern electronics, many pneumatic control systems have now been replaced by electronic control systems. However, even these days, many industrial actuators are pneumatic in nature. There are certain advantages associated with pneumatic control systems. They are very safe because you handle air only. It is cheap. It also generates more torque to its own weight compared to electrical actuators. However, the disadvantage of pneumatic control systems is its slow response. This is a flapper nozzle system is the basis of all pneumatic transmitters. The flapper nozzle system consists of a fixed flow restriction or orifice and a variable resistor, a variable restrictor nozzle and flapper. So, it is a very simple system consists of an orifice which provides a fixed flow, fixed flow restriction and a nozzle and flapper which acts as a variable restrictor. Air at a fixed pressure, let us denote that pressure by P s 
flows through a nozzle past a restriction in the tube. So, the air at fixed pressure flows through this restriction and through this nozzle. Now, due to the presence of the flapper, there will be a back pressure that will alter the output pressure P0 also called as signal pressure. Altering the gap between nozzle and flapper alters the resistance to air flow and hence the output pressure. Increase in x will lower the resistance that means increasing the gap between the flapper and the nozzle will lower the flow resistance and fall in the output pressure. So, thus P0 which can be very easily measured using a good pressure measuring instrument and P0 can be calibrated with the gap that exists between the flapper and the nozzle. That means, the displacement can be calibrated with the output pressure P0. So, let us repeat once again the flapper nozzle system consists of a fixed flow resistance and a variable restrictor. Orifice is the fixed flow res resistance and a nozzle and flapper works as a variable restrictor. Air at fixed pressure flows through this restriction and then through the nozzle. Because of the presence of the flapper, a back pressure will be developed and as the gap between the nozzle and the flapper changes, this back pressure will change. Increase in the gap between nozzle and flapper will lower the resistance and fall the output pressure. So, the output pressure can be directly calibrated in terms of the gap between the flapper and the nozzle that means distance. So, if we plot the output pressure versus the gap, you will see that in the range of 3 to 15 psi pressure, we have an approximately linear relationship and that is the 3 to 15 psi pressure is the working range which is linear. So, we will end our discussion today with the flapper nozzle system and tomorrow in the next class we will talk about the other electromechanical transducers like LVDT, capacitive type, piezoelectric type and the resistance to engage.